It's still got a spinning disk, so it's slow. All right, so this is in uh, the first part. Yeah, I found it. It's page eight. Page eight. Oh, okay. Where you talk about of uh, notes number two. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to talk about it for a couple of minutes because I mean I think I get the general idea that it's sort of you know like I get what it does like visually, hmm. um, and I understand that you can do you can achieve convolution basically by you know in time by multiplying in frequency, and that that's equivalent to doing the convolution. That's a way of right. doing it. Right. Right. Um, but I kind of vaguely recall you talking about convolution and shifting and um, convolution and shifting. Maybe I'm mixing that up with something else. So there's a, I mean, there's many uh, Fourier theorems. There's the convolution theorem. There's the shift theorem. Each of those leads to a set of Fourier. Each, each theorem is associated with a Fourier dual that I give as a shorthand for the theorem. Really. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, convolution and shifting are two very useful um, Fourier duals. Okay, what was, so the shift one then, um, maybe I just ran that in with convolution in my head, even though it's totally distinct. Um, so I, I kind of am forgetting what the shift one said. So the, um, uh, the shift theorem, let's see, can I find it? Um, hmm. Okay, there's Fourier. And uh, there's our definition of Fourier transform. Uh, here's, here's the shift theorem. And, uh, I'm going to put uh, everything on silent. Okay, um, so uh, basically, uh, uh, if you have a um, a, uh, <coughs> a, a a wave f, a time series f, mm -hmm. and you uh, and this is in continuous form, of course, but the same thing works in Disguise. in discrete form. Yeah. Um, so there's two. There's essentially two versions of uh, of uh, f. There's little f of t. Okay, there's little f of t right there. Uh, but um, there's little f of t, and then there's little f of t, which has been delayed by this shift time shift t zero. Okay, which means that the the wavelet has been shifted to a later time. Okay. All right. So if you had a, a Richter wavelet or something that starts at zero time. You know, now it's really going to start at t zero, at uh, f of t minus t zero. Um, so little f has a Fourier dual, which is just big F of omega. Little f of t is a Fourier dual, which is big F of omega. Here's big F of omega. What the Schiff's theorem is saying is that the doing the shift in time. Okay, if you transform that to the shifted wave into the Fourier domain, then um, the, uh, the time shift in the Fourier domain is the same as taking, uh, of course, you have the Fourier transformed big F of omega, and you multiply it, you know, point by point times e to the minus i times omega times t sub zero, the shift. Okay. Okay, so in this case, t sub zero is a constant, right? And as you go through each component <coughs> um, of the Fourier transformed f at each frequency omega, you know, then this, uh, this uh, uh, Euler exponential takes another value. And it's worth noting that the, there's, there's a great similarity between this Euler exponential here that implements the shift in the frequency domain and the Fourier transform uh, exponential itself. It's quite similar. I mean, t yeah. is not constant in it, but it's... Uh, uh, Damn near it, the it's, same thing. <laughs> it's very, yeah, yeah, it's very familiar. Uh, and we'll actually make use of that uh, later on. 
so I guess with the guy, I hate to draw, I hate to make a picture because <laughs> um, just kind of describe the picture. So I'm drawing just like I, I've drawn two waves: a continuous wave, um, and then just a wavelet. And right, right. I'm kind of thinking about the fact that you know I can make a wavelet wherever I want just by windowing, like just saying that I'm going to go from right um, delta t to and delta now, t. Now our 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 um, uh, our uh, our you know the theory this the this theorem here for instance this Fourier dual is um, applies equally to continuous functions that go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and also to to uh, functions on a limited time axis. Okay. And of course, all of the thing the thing you have to realize is that in once we start discretizing, once we start sampling our our data and time, we never ever have a truly continuous function. Even if it looks continuous within our time sample, there are times for which we have no data. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, and, and that's um, that's kind of rendered in FFT Lab by the circularity, the cyclicity of of FFT Lab. You know where where the the uh, the last point connects back to the first point, and you realize we're just going around the unit circle. So that's that's clear in frequency on the lower part. But it's also true in time on the on the top part. It's if you only have, as you do here, thirty-two points in your in your real world data in your time series, then uh, you know the thirty-two points of time is has to be cyclic as well. Okay. According to I mean yeah, for it to be for it to work in Fourier theory, that's that's the assumption that Fourier theory makes. So. I hate to jump to something else, and I do want to come back to that because I had a little bit more on that, but just while we're kind of talking about the cyclical nature of this, okay. um, I was just kind of thinking about how this, you know, I'm just trying to get a good model in my head of how all this works, and, you know, I was thinking of, you know, kind of our discussions about the unit circle, mm -hmm. and how if I have some arbitrary signal, like, you know, whatever, right, um, right. how when... I'm doing a Fourier transform, and I'm going from time to frequency. You know, I was kind of thinking about, so it seems like it sort of works by, you know, I have these components, I go along and I sample this, and basically I'm getting these things that are, you know, in somewhere on my unit circle based on the data, and then when you're actually taking the Fourier transform, it seems like the the spectrum intensity, does it have anything to do with, so, you've got these points on it, and, you know, you can kind of think of them like vectors, and they have, you mean the Fourier, uh, the Fourier complex, yeah. which are, which are imaginary numbers, yeah, I mean, not, sorry, well, they're complex like, numbers, yeah, which they're are somewhere numbers. out there, and they're, you know, somewhere right. between zero and the edge of your circle, and right, so, is that is that kind of what's going on? Like, is it? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the way to to move into that is is through the uh, the Z transform, um, and realizing that uh, uh, you can turn the Z transform into the Fourier transform. With this definition of Z, where is that? Uh, let's see. You can see transformers at the very beginning. Right, but now, oh, you're now we up. want the um, the Fourier definition of, of Z. It's, it's probably um, further. as far as that goes.
Um, right. If, you know, the Z transform is a way, a way of representing discretized time, right? And, um, okay. And here we go. So here's the, uh, in, in lab, or in uh, notes three, that's the Fourier definition of Z. And it's clearly for sample time because, you know, delta T is, is there. Now, you have to be careful because in a lot of what Clairbout shows you in the book and, and all that, and sometimes in my notes, we'll just draw, we'll just assume delta T is equal to one and drop it, you know, for, uh, uh, for, for simplicity. But uh, it, it really is, uh, it really is there. Um, so, so now whatever delta T is, whatever, um, whatever, uh, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, whatever omega is, okay, the, um, this, uh, uh, this, um, this definition of Z, the, the complex value of Z is always on a unit circle, as you, as you saw. Um, you know, because it's uh, cosine omega delta T uh, plus I sine omega delta T. Um, so the, uh, the time series itself is a... Uh, uh, at, at, at one value of omega, okay, the time series is a bunch of, of coefficients, you know, real coefficients of these, uh, <clears throat> uh, of these points that are, that are, uh, you know, scales of these points that are, that are around the unit circle. So they are, uh, you know, displacing, right? The, the coefficient is displacing that, that value, you know, away to the extent they're different from one, the coefficients, they're displacing the values uh, away from the uh, unit circle. And of course, the ones that we don't have data for where the coefficient is zero, that's at the center of the, of the unit circle. So I think that actually is helping a lot. So I just wanna draw another picture really quickly. So I, I've just drawn another unit circle, and I'm just imagining, essentially, you know, I'm thinking of this, the sum yeah. that you have. Right, that's a, that's a Z polynomial. Yeah. But um, it turns out, if you take this definition of Z, it's also the Fourier transform component at, you know, once you do all the, once you add all the parts of the polynomial together, then it is the Fourier transform at that omega, if you take omega constant. Yeah, so I'm just imagining I'm just imagining a situation where I only have one of those. So one where I'm a sum of one, and I only have one coefficient and one sine cosine. So thing. you have a so you have a, a, a one length time series. Yeah, just just for or or just, or, or, or maybe it's a spike. It's yeah. A, I, I'm just I'm okay. just thinking of something that's really simple and easy for me to draw. So kind of going back to my unit circle. It's always good have, to it's always good to to test with uh, with spikes with with delta functions because they tell you what the impulse response of the transform is. Yeah. So okay. if it's something like that, then um, just going around the circle, then I, I just have one thing, kind of. If I'm just thinking of plotting this out on my unit circle, and I only have the one coefficient and one you know, cosine sine. But you're allowing, you're allowing frequency to take any, uh, any value. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I essentially so you have, have you have uh, um, if it's a delta function equal to one, then you have one times one times e to the power of i omega delta t. Okay, and um, uh, and so okay, delta t can be one, and so e to, you have e to the i omega, and that uh, cosine plus i sine. Right. Uh, of uh, of omega, um, so th that's a uh, you know that's a point on the unit circle for uh, uh, for each different frequency. Yeah, so you would get you know like some something plotted in the unit circle, and then there'd be a place where it was larger, but you know at higher 
Well, only if you're if you, if instead of you know you're taking a delta function of value one with coefficient one, you have some other coefficient, and it will be a circle either inside or outside the circle, right? Because it'll be the same coefficient, the same f sub n, right? Um, you know, so it'll be a, a half unit circle or you know two unit circle if f sub n is uh, is is half or or two. Okay, it'll still be a circle. It'll still be a perfect circle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's, you know, making its value for all different frequencies around the circle from 0 to 2 pi, uh, which is really from minus, minus pi to pi, right? Because we really consider the principal fold to be from, um, from minus the, the, uh, the Nyquist to the positive Nyquist, you know, minus pi to pi with 0 in the middle. So okay. then you have to, uh, uh, then you put uh, yeah, FFT lab on origin center. So uh, this is that, um, yeah, so the real is the, uh, <clears throat> is, so these are the real and imaginary values going around the unit circle, right? The real is the cosine part, the imaginary is the sine part. And um, and this is exactly that because we got one coefficient. Now it'll it'll self scale, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know what we set the uh, the the value of the spike to. We won't, but it but it will, you know, it is actually changing the values of these uh, real imaginary parts. They're being scaled by the by the coefficient f sub n uh, back to back to here. Yeah, so just to sort of finish off, could you, could you go back to the FFT lab? Yeah. So, when it comes up with the, you know, this, uh, the intensity, essentially, you know, the, the vertical scale. Yeah. That's the, but that's the Fourier, you know, you might be tempted to call it the, the spectrum. The spectrum is the square of it, right? Or the magnitude of the complex number. But it's a complex number, which is the we call it, let's call it the Fourier component, or or sometimes as Clairvaux calls it the Fourier transform, or Fourier transform component. Okay, because I was so I was sort of thinking about these as being the magnitude. So can you can you say that one more time? It's the <clears throat> okay. So so it's the you know here we have um, the real and imaginary parts of the Fourier transform of this spike. Okay, and the real part is the cosine uh, of omega. The imaginary part is the sine of omega. <coughs> um, and the uh, 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 the real and imaginary part. That's a uh, complex number. So at you know, say this frequency zero right here. Okay. That, that has a real part of, of one, say, and an imaginary part of zero. Okay. Okay. But that's a complex number, which is the, uh, the uh, Fourier, uh, 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 you know, strictly it's the Fourier transform of, of f of t, right? We've got f of t here, real and nothing in the imaginary, and here's f of omega, big f of omega, which is the Fourier transform of I, I, un I understand what you're saying. Now, these are essentially the coordinates of where it would be at on the unit circle, and the intensity is just when I take the vector magnitude. Those right. Two things. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. That that's actually, well. That's, well. Well. If you take the vector magnitude, you have an amplitude spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that makes oh, that makes sense now because I'm just having a hard time kind of placing. Cause, you know, I'm pretty visual. I'm just having a hard time kind of placing that on the unit circle. But I think I think that makes more sense now. Right. Right. Um, now let's see, you know, I tried to add the ability of, <laughs> we'll see what <laughs> happens. Try refreshing it. Yeah. That may be the easiest. Um. You know, once you once you take 
get the magnitude of those two, you know, you, you got to keep the, you know, remember that there's a, there's a real part, there's an imaginary part. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, together, at the magnitude of that complex number, that is the amplitude spectral component. Okay, so uh, uh, let me put this origin centered again. Okay, so, uh, you know, at zero frequency here, the real part is one, the imaginary part is zero, so the, the amplitude is, is one. Um, the spectral, uh, the, the, the amplitude spectral component at zero frequency is one. Let's look at um, <clears throat> this frequency here. That's uh, pi over four. Okay. Okay, and there the real part is zero. The imaginary part is one. Okay, and so they still have an amplitude of zero. And if you, if you think about this, oh, you know, this cosine is going down as I go from zero frequency to pi over four and and in the imaginary it's increasing as i go from zero frequency to pi over four so actually you know any one of these if i was to get the uh the amplitude it would be one so so actually right across here the the amplitude spectrum would be perfectly flat okay yeah, okay yeah i think i think that makes sense because Um, and that, in fact, is the uh, is the amplitude uh, that is the amplitude spectrum of uh, of, right of, a, uh, <laughs> of, of, of a uh, of a delta function. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I think that's actually good for now. So the, the kind of to jump back to where, where we were talking about before. Before I jump to that, we were, we were talking about the. Uh, the convolution. Kind of the difference between the window, what a, a window and a shift. Ah, okay. Um, so there's this early example. Um, oh, let's see. Yeah. Where I have, um, I superimpose to, you know, a, a, a wavelet and a shifted wavelet. Maybe a scaled and shifted wavelet, but mm -hmm. the sh you know the wavelet in in z polynomial terms is the x, is uh, the z polynomial x of z, and then here you know because the uh, the wavelet is uh, um, because z is the is the unit um, uh, uh, the unit delay operator. If I multiply by uh, z to the tenth power, I'm delaying it by ten times delta t, and so here's another copy, added on, right? And so uh, you know, if, and if you work this out, which would be easy enough to do if if you kept it to, uh, you know, if 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 x was just uh, you know a spike at zero time, right? It would be uh, 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 one say one times z to the zeroth power. Um, you know, that, uh, that would be the z polynomial, and then this one would be, um, one times z to the 10th power, right? And, and all the other powers of z, all the other, you know, possible, uh, z polynomials would have, or z, uh, polynomial components would have, uh, zero, um, uh, yeah, there's no coefficients. Uh, uh, zero coefficients, right. So you would see a spike here at zero time, and uh, and then another spike here at, at ten delta t. Okay. Um, so that's uh, uh, you know that shift now now you know uh, once you uh, once you take the the Fourier definition of z, you can see that that shift has has an implication on the unit circle too. Yeah. So that's kind of what uh, what I was to is that so what we have here is we have you know an original wavelet and then the same thing 10 you know cycles later yeah. um, between which there's nothing so right if I was to take the Fourier transform of this and then take the Fourier transform of the whole thing um, 
the amplitude spectrum should be the same, right? Because well, you, you, the... you've doubled the energy, right? So oh, the okay. So it would actually it would be, be okay. larger, but but, but it, it would be in the same, same places. It should be the same shape, right? So so here's a here's a, a simple spike, right? And um, and uh, it it. Uh, um, uh, it has this Fourier transform, which actually we just talked about how the the uh, the spectrum is is all ones. Yeah. Okay. At every frequency. Um. So uh, you know I can add another spike. <laughs> Wait for the computer to catch up to me. Okay. And. Uh, and this is the linear superposition of the in the in the omega domain. That's the linear super, superposition of that simple, broad, cosine and sine wave we saw before, and this one here. Okay. Um, which, as you can see, at larger time, and this is this is an important concept in this class. Um, at larger time, you get waves that appear to be higher quote unquote frequency in the in the omega domain in the frequency domain okay it's just there's just no convenient way to to describe this um, other than um, uh, yeah and that's as clean as I can make that wave uh, there's no convenient way to describe this other than than Talking about frequency, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, what you see in the bottom, you would describe very naturally as a high frequency wave. But since it's on a frequency axis, that's not quite right. But yeah, and we still just have to describe it that it's way. It's not actually, because it's the same wave. It's just, just empty time before it. It's, 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 well, it's been shifted in time. Uh, so, so that shows the the parallelism between the two domains, okay? Because I really get the same thing if I take a um, uh, okay. So if I have draw, okay. All right. So let's see. That's not so good. here. Okay. So, so, look what I've done here. I've uh, I've taken what I had in the time domain, and it's made a, um, a cosine sine combination in the frequency domain. I mean, I'm sorry. In the, yeah, I, I know what you meant. <laughs> See, I, yeah, it's just impossible. <laughs> yeah, um, because it's so parallel. Now, now you'll notice that this is the actually the negative of the imaginary part. Um, so there is that subtle, there's that sign difference between the, the forward Fourier transform. We had a spike in the time domain. The forward Fourier transform gave us a cosine and a, and a sine. When we, go, when we do the inverse transform and have a, a spike in the, in the omega domain, okay, we still get the cosine in, on the real part in the time domain. We get a negative, cos, negative sign on the imaginary part in the time domain. But other than that, it's exactly parallel. It's a it's a really nice Fourier dual, um, and uh, uh, so I can add a higher frequency spike, right? And that's pretty much what I had, you know, for uh, 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 you know it's a and this now looks like a higher frequency wave in the uh, in the time domain. Okay. Okay, I think that I think that makes um, I think that kind of makes sense. So just just one more question, kind of on this topic, was um, I'm thinking back to uh, the you know the high frequency wave that we had here based uh, when we just had the two spikes in the time. Can we just make that really quick? Um, if you zero it, and just put a spike there. So we'll have a we'll have an early spike. Yeah, and then and a later spike. And a later spike. Yeah, and. I'm just trying to think about what, so the amplitude spectrum for this, yeah, I, I just find it a lot easier to think about that than, you know, 
and what's actually going on here. So if I think about what the amplitude spectrum for this should be, if, I mean, so since these two spikes, you know, they're two, the two direct deltas just yeah. offset by some time. Um, so the frequency intensity. For the I mean, two, I mean, we get, we get, uh, with this, we move the spike, we move the one spike down. Yeah. And, um, um, and we get a, uh, another, you know, cosine sine combination just to just, you know, with more rapid variation in Omega or higher frequency as I just going to have to say it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, 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 and then we, we, but, but if you go through and, and add up the lengths of all these vectors, right? Like at zero frequency, you know, we got one and zero in the imaginary. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> uh, that's going to add to um, that's going to add up to to one. Yeah, so it's you still going to be exactly the same. It's going to be flat spectrum, yeah. as I would have if I right, not right. shifted it. Okay. Now we put in this other this other spike. Okay, we got the uh, let's say these were both amplitude one. Okay, we would have an amplitude spectrum of one from one spike and an amplitude spectrum of one from the other spike, and you add them together, everything adds together very nicely. Yeah, so it'd be uh, twice as much. Yeah, it'd be, two, okay. you know, it'd be a flat two. Okay, oh, that, that makes sense. I, I just was a little caught up on it, but that, that makes sense. Okay. It would be nice if, if there was a, you know, uh, a, a, an ap a absolute spectrum display also for each of these in time and, uh, and, and omega. I find it a lot easier to think about what the actual what the amplitude is, but <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, so kind of uh, moving on from that to um, actual uh, homework questions. <laughs> I'll try and kind of keep it brief because I need through most of our time. Um, so I wanted to briefly talk about uh, uh, question four. This is the unit circle one. So, page 13, exercise three. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, okay. So, number four, the last one on that, or the last of the... Uh, number four of three. <laughs> a, a, uh, a frequency sampled at 10 points per wavelength. wavelength. Yeah. <clears throat> so, one wavelength is zero to two pi, so it's my whole, it's my whole unit circle. Um, yeah. Okay. Or minus, minus pi to pi. You know, it's two pi, two pi bandwidth. That's all you got. Yeah. Um, so is it, God, I hate to just ask it like this directly. Is that just saying that I'm essentially just sampling evenly across my entire circle? Um, because in what way? I mean, what's, so like, what's sampled evenly? Okay. So like I have a. I have this signal, which it says. I mean, what I'm, is what is the frequency in, in the in the context of the unit circle? What is where do you find frequency? Um, it's not the real component. It's not the imaginary component. Um, it's not the coefficient. Where do you find frequency? Well, let's see. So I mean, omega so, so is So where is where is where is unit where is zero frequency on the on the uh, at zero and 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 what is what what geometrically what's zero there? Um, I mean, you're on the unit circle, so we know we know it's somewhere on that circle. Oh, well, so geometrically, that's in the middle of zero zero. No, no, oh, okay. no, no. Zero frequency. Has uh, is still in the unit circle, so it can't be in the it can't be at the origin. Okay, then it's right, right there. Right, and so um, now, how do you locate yourself on that circle? Uh -huh. How do you describe that location? If if well, I would call it either zero or two pi, depending on. Okay, and what is that? What is that zero or two pi? It's an omega. It's an angle. You're 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 like, swiping your hand. It's yeah. an angle. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm getting at. Okay. The frequency is an angle. So zero frequency is zero angle. It's an angle from the real axis, uh, counterclockwise angle from the 
real axis. So, um, so zero frequency is is at an angle of zero. The uh, and the Nyquist is where? It's at pi. Right. So that's 180 degrees, an angle of 180 degrees. That's that's on the negative real axis. Um, and then uh, uh, where where is um, uh, where is uh, um, uh, where are the negative frequencies? Um, it should be quadrants three and four, right? Yeah, on the unit circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're below the the real axis. Yeah, and um, uh, okay. So this frequency sampled at ten points per wavelength, and so we go back to the uh, Fourier definition of z. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, um, so we have, uh, 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 so what does it mean? Ten points per wavelength. Then, uh, how do we, how um, do we put that delta t in there? Well, let's just imagine we're using this wavelength right there. Uh huh. So I have ten evenly spaced points, which then corresponds to ten evenly spaced points, you know, somewhere on my unit circle. Right. So so um, let's see. And you know, a wavelength, I guess. So if this is zero to two pi, you know, this would be ten evenly spaced points going between zero and two pi on the uh, unit circle. Is that is that right? Um, I'm gonna make sure I'm not misleading you. I'm gonna check out the uh, the solution set. Okay. Because <laughs> I can't always remember these things. This is column four again? Yeah. And it's the last part. Right, so so one wavelength is uh, is two pi. Right? So uh, so then, where would you? What angle would you find the the ten points per wavelength uh, frequency at? Um, two pi divided by ten. Yeah, spacing. pi over five, right? Okay, okay. Then that. So that that I, I just was a little. Con I mean, I thought that's what it was, but I was a little confused just because of the. Oh no! Never mind. Actually, that I, I was kind of getting hung up on the fact that these quadrants would be negative frequencies and these would be positive frequencies, but I, I think that's okay, actually. It's, yeah, okay. Because 10 points per wavelength means that um, we're at omega is the omega is the Nyquist omega divided by 5. So that's the, the Nyquist omega is pi. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about doing it. Okay. Okay, um, I think that's good. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was um, this 
Um, so on question nine, um, you ask about the 2D Fourier transform, and it's basically about um, the uh, difference between if we have a. Well, I'll just let you pull it up. But yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, size two. Yeah, this one, um, the, the equivalence of f omega k and f negative omega k. Right, and right. So, I mean, you know, we talked a lot about how, you know, the 2D Fourier, Fourier transform is just, you know, it's take, you can do the discrete Fourier transform twice, essentially, is how you're getting there, like... Right, right. You, um, do, it, you do it in one direction, then yeah, you do it in the other direction. Yeah, and then you do it direction. in the other direction. But, so but, like, but each, each so the first thing to think about is just the, the frequency part. Yeah. So the, it for it, or 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 you, or, or one, anyway, one at a time. So so because these two are perfectly separable, omega and k, the Fourier transforms in omega is 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 completely separate from the Fourier transforms in k. So so the first thing we have to think about is, uh, all right. This must mean then that that if if f of omega k can be determined from f of minus omega and minus k, that means that f of omega can be determined from f of minus omega. Yeah. So, so what does that remind you? Of? Well, so the way I went about doing this is since you, since we straight off the bat say that you know the time function is real, I went and I found yeah. omega in time where I just did a discrete. Right. That's a, that's a crucial hint here. Yeah, so I just did a discrete, you know, a discrete Fourier transform with that, and you know, I showed that all that's left is the cosines, which are symmetric. So, since they're symmetric, negative omega is equal to positive omega. Yeah, just immediately without doing anything. But what I was getting a little more hung up on was with the k's, because well, well, well okay, so k, if you look at the Fourier transform of in omega, if you look at the Fourier transform in k, they're really exactly the same. Okay. So whatever you come up with for omega should, should apply be the same to k. k. It should be the same. So so you know once you come up with it for f of omega being determined from f of minus omega. Now now you're just by focusing on the on the cosine part, you're missing something. Because the transform, when 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 is the cosine part of the transform all you need? Well. If there is no imaginary part, then there is no I sine part. Uh, but there, uh, but there is. Remember uh, 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 the. Um, okay, so where's the diagram for the? Um, sorry about that. It's <laughs> all right. Where's the diagram for the um, uh, the Fourier transform? Um, uh, That's all about the discrete Fourier transform. Okay. Well, we could get to it from that too. I mean, if we just think about the definition of the Fourier transform, where it's you know, x of n. Well, well, what what is this? What, this discussion of of uh, omega versus minus omega. What does it remind you of? Um, the only the only time we talked about you know relating the the, there's only one time before we've talked about relating the the, uh, the positive time uh, with the, the negative time, or the positive frequency with the negative frequency. I don't know. I vaguely remember you doing something in FFP lab. With... So, so remember the discussion of, of even and odd functions? Yeah. Okay. And the 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 even part, you know, your your real time series, all real time series still has even and odd parts. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, and the the even parts go into the co are they're triggered by the co cosine um, part of the Fourier transform, and the odd parts trigger the imaginary uh, or uh, the uh, the sine transform, which then ends up on the imaginary. Yeah. So if it's all real, then there isn't an odd part, right? No, no. No, there's an odd. There, of course, there's an odd part. 
be, because and so and again we can go to FFT lab right so here's an all real all um, positive yeah, you know, this okay. all positive time it's got real animatory parts because there uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's even an odd parts right uh, and to make it totally even oh, let's see if it responds yeah I, I get it. it's kind of you know evenly spaced <coughs> well yeah or or I could make it why don't we just completely oh. completely odd? Um, yeah, let's just do two of them. <laughs> doing, a, doing a very good job. So now I basically uh, I've made a, an odd function, right, which results in a, in essentially a zero real part in the Fourier transform and a non-zero imaginary part. And then here is. <laughs> Here is an odd, uh, an even function, which essentially results in a zero imaginary part of the Fourier transform. So you you. <clears throat> so if it's saying that the time function, okay, I, I see what you're saying. So it says nothing about if the time function is even or odd, just that the time function is real. Okay. Right. Right. So given that, you can still concoct. Um, you know, you can still concoct a uh, a relationship between the uh, um, between the uh, 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 the negative frequency and the positive frequency. Just remember that that you've got to deal with the the fact that it's a complex number. The Fourier transform is of that real function is a complex number with non-zero imaginary parts. Okay. Um, I think I want to play with that actually a little bit more before we talk about it because I think I think that actually that should get should from there. solve it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, question ten. Um, I'll, I'll know, try and keep it. You know it's, it ten, with, you know it's yeah. ten o'clock. Can we go for like five minutes? Or it's fine with me. Okay. Yeah. He's reviewing like chemistry stuff. And then Okay. And it's late. I'm not okay. Super worried about that. Um, so, uh, question ten um, shows uh, what would change. It shows a picture. Um, it's a, basically a two D Fourier transform. Yeah. And it shows a picture of a pulse, and then the response from that, and basically asks you what happens if you move it, the pulse earlier on the time axis, or whatever. But uh, the second question is, it's asking about the time axis was smoothed, and it gives this one four six four one. Right. And, and I, right. I was just kind of trying to parse what what that's asking. So. So 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 again, let's let's go through this in um, in uh, uh, FFT lab. Just thinking about one one axis at a time. Okay. Like All I mean, right. I get that you can smooth it if you remove the high frequency stuff. I remember. Well, about well, that, well, but, but we'll 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 do that a little more directly. Okay. Right. So so uh, and, and I'll I'll go up to a a higher number of of uh, a higher uh, a higher number of samples in FFT lab. So you know basically we have we have a spike or a box, right? And uh, Okay, here we go. Too many samples. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the, it's not like the computational load is too great. It's it's all this. It's the video recording problem. You know. All right. So so. If I if I have a pulse that's early in in time, right? Here's here's. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, actually. Yeah. One one difficult thing about this, notice the pulse that the really early in time. <laughs> uh, right, right, right. Um, but but notice that the uh, and and what's let's read the figure number on that. Um, I think it was the right 10? figure. This. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let me put that on the screen here. So that 
That is uh, which which exercise? Um, you gave a direct link to the. Okay, so that's yeah. exercise ten, right? Oh dear. Um, Very high resolution figure. Uh, well, I'm just expanding <laughs> to way too much. There we go. Um, notice that that the the in in frequency, spatial frequency, horizontal, time frequency, vertical. Um, it is it is zero centered. Oh yeah. Okay. In 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 space and time, it's not. Okay. So the, the you know you know we, there's a little bit of translation to do. You know because because all of our FFT lab is either centered or it's not. Okay. So so here you know this is up against the le the, the 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 top in time, for instance. Okay. Or we could take it as the space axis. So, so if I put a spike out here and then zero out the other one, okay, I got a much higher frequency wave in the frequency domain. <clears throat> I mean, it's more rapidly varying in in omega, but uh, that I, you know, I just have to say it's a higher frequency wave in, in omega. Okay, so that's what's what's going to happen. <clears throat> And and you'll notice that it's um, uh, on the space axis. It's it's very low frequency. Okay, so it's a it's a broad wave, <clears throat> and on the and so it should be uh, it should be a broad wave. Okay, <clears throat> on the space axis, it should be a broad wave. Okay, and in in time, <coughs> it's a, it's a little bit further. It should be a not so broad wave. Okay, like that. And we're looking at the real part, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so it's a not so broad wave. And and if you if you look at the uh, figure, okay, in in space, it's a broad wave. And in time, vertically, it's it's a tighter wave, and that makes it that and and you and it does that by making a tilt. Yeah. Okay. So if it was, um, if if actually it was up against, you know, you can speculate, you know, what if it was up against zero in space? Well, then then it would be flat. it would be flat, which means that the tilt would be flat. The wave would be flat in space in the spatial direction. We didn't change the the time direction, so we'd have the same we'd have the same frequency. Wait, so if it was just bars, like perfectly flat, yeah, I mean it was just a sine, or what do you mean a sine? Just a sine wave plotted out and well, well, so so this is the combination where it's a lower frequency sine wave in the horizontal direction. And a higher frequency sine wave in the vertical direction. Okay. So that would be, you know, that's these tilted bars, and it's uh, uh, if we made it, if we took, if we took it to zero time in space, it would be absolutely flat in space. I mean, if we took it to zero coordinate in space, it would be there would be no variation in space, which means the bars would be horizontal. The bars in, in the vertical direction have to be the same. Yeah. The same frequency is the only way I can say it. Or the same wavelength. Um, so they'd be flat bars. You know, if we if we if we went to uh, in the spatial direction, if we went to a a larger uh, spatial coordinate, then um, then these 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 bars would get more and more tilted, and and eventually they would get vertical. Yeah, no, I think I think I get that. I'll find what I what I wasn't actually clear on though is what it means by smooth. With yeah. Okay. One so four, let's six, let's four, one. Okay. So that's a that's a second thing, right? And so I'll. Uh, okay. Now now. Uh, let's see. When I had a spike, okay, <clears throat> I had a perfect sine wave. Okay, 
okay. And here this one is close to zero time, so it's a pretty, it's a fairly broad sine wave. Not real broad, but fairly. Um, and I, I turn that into a delta function. I'll make it a four length delta function. Now it's clear in the real part that I have a sync function. Okay, and not quite because I didn't, didn't draw my box car that well. Um, so now, now I'll, uh, I'll uh, smooth it. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, what's happened? Um, compare, okay, so we have the, the sharp box car, and, and it's a sync function, but notice the, the sync, the, the energy doesn't die off very yeah. fast. And we smooth that. Yeah, yeah. okay. And it dies off faster. So, so it, that, hasn't, that hasn't really affected the, the wavelength in here in the frequency domain, but it's affected where we can see it. So when it says smooth with like a 14641, that's just basically referring to what the amplitudes are well, let's in see. pulse. Uh, so like, let's let's put in. Uh, you pick something where yours is like smoothed by I don't know four eight eight four one four six four one. We can just put that in directly. Yeah. So that 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 terminology just is basically telling you like what the smoothing factor. Well, he's, is he's giving you he's the, giving you the wave. You know. Okay. He, he's giving you the the. I mean, it's a smoothing wavelet, but it, that I mean that's um, so you can see at the at the edges. You know, this is origin center, right? And at the edges, it's near zero. So okay, going back here, what we're seeing is is the same thing in um, in uh, uh, in space, right? It's smooth in space right now. Yeah, and the uh, and oh, I didn't even notice that his is smooth. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have to look at the yeah. the the, okay. <laughs> the full image. The uh, and notice that it's you know the smoothing doesn't change the 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 main stripe. Yeah, it just changes, so it's it, just going to shoot. Just it, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it's kind of see how it's kind of this oval yeah. shape. No, I get it. Because so it's smooth. It it's smooth so. more in in space horizontally than it is in time. Okay, okay, that that actually makes a lot of sense. So, you know, if we smooth this less, right, just by getting rid of the ones. Right, then it starts getting higher amplitude near the edges. Yeah, and you'd have noisier, higher frequencies right. on the edge of your... Right. Okay. And in fact, you know, if we go all the way back to the spike, right, it's just yeah, as high it's as symmetrical the edges everywhere. As everywhere else. So yeah. if you so if you were to plot if you were to plot in space just like a cosine, it'd just look like lines essentially, like Right. Like that. Right. Right. Okay. If there was no smoothing at all. Yeah. And here there's like minimal smoothing. Right, and it's still pretty strong at the edges. This is more like the the vertical direction, the time direction. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, you know what? I just looked at the time. I think I better run. Um, right. Okay, so we're gonna. But uh, we'll stop the recording. Hope I can. Um, if I can stop the recording. <laughs> <sighs> Didn't you it stop? say press escape when you started? Oh. Uh, Never mind. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there oh, we go. There it goes. It's still going, I think.